I think there's a misnomer or there's a misunderstanding in terms of conservative, liberal, when it comes to guns, gun ownership, gun rights and laws, right? They've drawn this invisible line in the sand and told you, the American people, you can either be on this side or that side. And that's not true. You're listening to Talking About Guns, or TAG as we like to call it. My name is Matt Littman. I'm executive director of 97%. We're a new bipartisan organization working to reduce gun deaths in America. As part of our mission to change the conversation around gun safety, TAG normalizes dialogue about guns. We invite guests from all sides of the gun debate, and we talk about the hot button issues, but without the screaming. Later in this episode, Dr. Michael Siegel, a renowned researcher and professor at Tufts University, joins us for another edition of Siegel's Scope, where he'll magnify a particular area of gun ownership and gun policy. But first, my guest today is former NFL offensive tackle, screenwriter, and 97% board member Ephraim Salam. Ephraim is a 13-year NFL veteran who played for five teams after being drafted by the Atlanta Falcons in 1998. He earned recognition as the youngest player to ever start in the Super Bowl. He's currently a writer and producer for TV and film, working on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air reboot called Bel-Air. Ephraim Salam, welcome to TAG. Uh, Ephraim, you were an NFL lineman for how many years? I was an NFL lineman for 13 years. I may not have this right, but did, were you the first rookie starting lineman in the Super Bowl? Am I right about that? Close? I was, I was the fourth rookie ever to start all 19 games including the super bowl and the and the youngest player to ever start in the super bowl at the time is that right and then yes. what did, you were on uh atlanta when you were the atlanta school? falcons okay and then your career ends and then you somehow turn that into production activism writing uh I mean, this is like the definition of a renaissance man. How did this all happen? Because this is not a, a normal route. Um, I, I'll tell you what. Playing in the NFL, being drafted where I was drafted, 199th pick in the draft. Uh, this was a couple years before Tom Brady, so I'm the original uh, success story of, of, <laughs> of pick 199. That's the sixth round, right? For me, it was the seventh round. Seventh round. Okay. Yes. Wow. For me, for me, it was the seventh round. Uh, I would have loved to have six round money back then. I just, you know, um, but that was probably one of the most difficult things. Number one, getting to the league, getting drafted, putting yourself in position to do that and then to get into the league and then start, you know, opening day of, of your rookie year and then carry that into a 13 year career. That was hard. Less than 0.1% of the population can do that. And, and and that's real. And from the type of effort and work ethic that that takes, I just use that in everything I do. I apply that to everything I do. So it no longer becomes a you can't or that's impossible. Because once you do something that's deemed impossible for the first time, what's something else right? right it's nothing now it becomes attainable now it becomes possible and so i take that mindset in, into everything i do when i got into broadcast um back in the late 90s as i was playing in the nfl there was no space for an offensive lineman the position i played to be on national radio or television but i was told oh well you guys should play your position I don't customarily get these jobs, but okay. That was just like, they told me I wouldn't make it to the NFL. So let me do my thing. Uh, and that worked, that opened up other doors uh, that moved me outside of the realm of sports broadcasts. And I became uh, a contributor on CNN talking about political uh, issues. Let's not forget that that's where we met. That is exactly where we met. Uh, <laughs> And, and so it just, it, it led into, I come from, I come from parents that marched in the civil rights movement. 
Both of my parents are older. They were born in the 40s. They grew up in the South. My mother, Newberry, South Carolina. My father, Shreveport, Louisiana. They marched. They fought. And I grew up in a household where we spoke about those things, where I got to share their, uh, you know, those moments with them. They, they made sure we were educated on the history of us in this country, uh, as well of our, as our descendants history in, in Africa. So I grew up in a household where my mother was a PhD educator and my father worked in the correctional, uh, the prison system as a correctional officer and a chaplain. So I had discipline and education as it, as my springboard and as my foundation to, to, to accomplishing the things that I wanted to accomplish. So coming from football into the other things that I, I've, I've been able to accomplish, it didn't seem like it was that tough to me because I knew what I wanted to do. And I knew if I just applied myself that I would, have a success at it. And, and I, and I have. So that's, that got you into, uh, out to Los Angeles to work in entertainment, right? You became a film yep. producer. And then, as you said, you were on CNN talking about issues and I'm sure that there are a few issues that are important to you, right? So you mentioned yes. one, um, but also gun ownership and gun safety is important to you as well. Oh, absolutely. I, and, I think, um, I think there's a misnomer or there's a misunderstanding in terms of conservative, liberal, when it comes to guns, gun ownership, gun rights and laws, right? They've drawn this invisible line in the sand and told you, the American people, you can either be on this side or that side. And that's not true. We know that as adults, it's people who are who feel that they are educated know that that's not true, right? I, as a Democrat and as a liberal, I am 100% behind people having gun ownership, 100%. It is our right as Americans to be able to own a gun for recreational use, hunting or whatever, but to protect your family. So I don't subscribe to this or that, because it's not a this or that issue. It's about number one, safety, protecting yourself, protecting your family. Well, let me let me ask and, you something here. Go me. ahead. When you say that's the first, so when you're getting a gun for the first time, mm -hmm. are you already uh, married with a family? How did that work? When did you I, do that? The, my the first time I, I was not married with a family. I was living in Atlanta. And uh, this is going to age me, but Y2K was happening, right? And you, if you guys remember the rumblings, the world is going to end. Yep. It's all over. Yeah. The computers can't handle <laughs> the number, right? They can't, right. they can't equate what the two and the zero, the world is going to collapse. The economic system that we all right. have thrived under is, is going to be non-existent. The lights will shut off and, and we will be in, you, you know, an archaic time of pandemonium and whatever, what they were saying. So I was like, well, I, that, that doesn't work for me. And so I went out and I purchased, registered and purchased a shotgun. For time. safety purposes. For safety. How for tall safety are you? Purposes. I'm 6'8". Six, 6'8". Eight. Six, eight. So you are, six, generally eight. speaking, not somebody who people would, am I allowed to curse on here? Yes. You're not somebody people would fuck with normally. No, no, I don't. I, no, I don't. I, unless you're stone crazy, which is even worse. So, you know. Uh, but you yeah, feel that you need a gun for safety. Well, yeah, because uh, especially living in the South, that's part of the culture down there. Right. right? So if you break into my house with a gun and I'm trying to use now, my size doesn't matter. Right. You know, so just to be safe, and 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 I'll and I'll tell you this, I'll give you this caveat. I didn't grow up with guns. I didn't. I wasn't allowed to play with water guns. I wasn't allowed to remember uh, when Nintendo came out. 
in in the early '80s, and it came with Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. So you got one controller, and then you got one gun that you use for Duck Hunt. Well, when we bought, when my mother bought me Nintendo, I never played Duck Hunt. I don't even, I never want the she took the gun out of the box. I had never, I to this day, I haven't seen it since. And so I grew up in a time where um, gun violence was just ripping through our communities as African Americans. Grew up in Inglewood, uh, grew up in South Central Los Angeles, and in the mid '80s. And it was it was almost like the Wild West. So my mother wouldn't allow us to play with any form of guns because, as you remember, water guns back then or cap guns or BB guns resembled sure. actual guns. African American kids getting gunned down by police officers because they had fake guns, replica guns, water guns, and. And, and, and all of those, it, it was so much of a thing that companies started to make them look like you, you, you know, fluorescent green and blue and pink and, and all that. You can't have a fake gun look like a real gun. They should sell them in the stores. Right, right. Sheriff badge with guns. So I didn't grow up in a household that, you know, we kept guns or we were allowed to to, to play with guns. Did your were your parents um, still around when you bought? Your shotgun? Oh yeah. Did they know that you bought a shotgun? Oh yeah. Did they oh, react yeah, I, I, to you I, buying a shotgun? Well, well, no, because at this time I'm an, I'm an adult. Uh, I, I'm an adult, and they understood that there is a need for you to protect yourself, right? There is an element, you know, everywhere that wishes to do you harm. So it is up to you to be able to protect yourself, be able to protect your family, be able to protect your home. That is. That is American, right? Was That's there what they say. That's American. Was there a um, amongst NFL players? Is there a culture of gun ownership? Do you guys talk oh. about it? Oh, yes, it's definitely a culture of gun ownership in, in the NFL. I don't know if you know this, but I haven't played in the NFL, so you tell me. Oh well, I didn't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, it looked like a, maybe a safety or maybe a, I don't, quarterback. Know, a kicker, quarterback. Kicker. Go no, ahead. well, no, no, no. Uh, maybe a kicker, punter, uh, but. There, there is a huge, there is a huge culture. So much so is when I did play for the Atlanta Falcons, we had a a law enforcement officer come out and a lawyer, and they came out and and they give us these these classes. So we'll know what the laws are, what we need to do, what we can do, what we can't do. And an NFL team is like a college team because guys come from all over the country. I came from California. As you know, we have very strict gun laws here, right? Can't ride around right. with a gun in your car. It's so it's so many different laws here in California, especially back then. And you go to the South, that is not the case. And so we had these authorities on the issue come speak to us as a team. And I'll never forget, he said, "If you, how many guys are you in here are gun owners? And you just see all the hands go up, just like hands more than 80 percent of the room uh and they say okay well he goes over some of the the georgia state gun laws and he said something i'll never forget he said if you get pulled over and you have a gun in the vehicle tell the officer immediately a matter of fact it'd be better if you had the gun in plain sight so the officer can see it and i thought to myself Oh, this man trying to get us shot. Right. 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 Because and, and 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 there's a little ignorance there on his this is a white man telling a room full of African Americans that if you have a gun in the vehicle, leave it so the officer can see it and then talk to him about it. Right? right. And as you all know. It doesn't even get that far. If I am pulled over and I have a gun on my dashboard or on the seat next to me or on my person, that officer at the window is not listening to me that I have a permit, I'm licensed. The immediate thought is a threat. Right. Right. I know this. 
because I've lived through things like that. And so I wasn't too keen on doing that. But it what it did was it showed me that out in Georgia, the laws are vastly different from in California. The way you can get a gun in Georgia is different than you can get a right. gun in California. Two quick stories that I'm going to tell. One is I told you once a few years ago, I was talking about when I was younger, I was in a car with a couple of friends. One of them may have had too much to drink. This is in Manhattan. I don't know if you remember this. The police pulled us over and said to me, you're sober. You drive to the bridge back to Long Island. We'll drive you. We'll escort you. And I told you this story about the police telling us they'll escort us to the bridge. And you said to me, that was not my experience. You said the police, and I never thought about it that way. You said the police escorted you to the bridge. And I said, yeah. One of my friends got out and threw up. The police waited. We kept driving. They drove us there. And you said, that wasn't my experience. Number two, the com you know, 97%, we invest in Vera, which makes a safe that looks like a holster. It's a smart technology. And one of the reasons why is goes back to Atlanta, which is that we had found out that at the football games, people were leaving their guns in their cars in the parking lot and they were getting stolen. Mm -hmm. And often those stolen guns get used in crimes. And this was a way to lock up the guns. But the story came from the guns being in the parking lot in Atlanta because people just leave their guns in their cars. Yeah, it's a, it in the South. It's I, I, you know what? You know what? Just. This is crazy that this is happening like this. About two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I was in Atlanta. I was visiting my father, checking on him, making sure he's okay. I took his truck to a dealership to get serviced. I'm sitting in the waiting area, and in walks a couple. And the first thing I noticed was a gun on his hip. And I was like, oh. It, it it caught me off guard. I was shocked and worried. I'm like, oh, okay. And he just walked. They came in. They're talking to the you know the dealership, the the salesman, and they're talking. And yeah, we have this car. We want to trade this in. And I'm just sitting back, like, what is happening right now? Like, what is going on? This man has a gun on his <laughs> hip, right? They go out. They leave. I'm like, wow. And it, it 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 dawns me. Oh, I'm I'm in Atlanta. I'm in, I'm in I'm in Georgia. Right. This is an open carry state. They come back in about an hour later, bringing their truck in for whatever. He gets out. He comes in. His wife or his girlfriend. She gets out. She she has a gun on her hip. I'm like, this is a black couple. They have his and her holsters with guns in them. And I'm like, oh, this is crazy. I don't know if I I don't know if I can live out here like this. Because you, you just never know. And yes, they're law-abiding law citizens. They have permits. They can do all of those things. It's just the sight of someone carrying a gun is still foreign and and and, and a little scary to me because you never know what people are thinking you never know if they're having a bad day right or any or any of those things so you know it it, it just uh it, it goes to show you that the vast differences of opinions and of laws within our own state right different parts of the country completely different cultures mm -hmm. totally common there they probably some people who are from georgia probably come here and say why isn't anybody walking around with a gun on their hip Right. Yeah. Do you feel that as a uh, that the in a professional sports league that the players feel any responsibility to be more responsible on gun safety or or not? Do you feel like there's a responsibility to be a bit of a role model or is that not even entering into the thinking? I, I don't think gun ownership and how you store it or how you use it. To be honest, I don't know if that's part of uh, of the mentality of, of gun ownership for athletes. I think the biggest thing is I have things that people want. I'm going to protect it at all costs. Right. And we've had story after story of 
players being followed home. As they go into the garage, someone comes in behind them, holds the family up. Um, you know, so, you know, things like this. When I was in Houston, one of our teammates uh, got held at gunpoint in his home. His family tied up and put in the closet. And, you know, when you start hearing stories like that, you panic as a, a professional athlete because you are a public figure. Right. People see you without you seeing them. And with that, you become a target. And if you're someone who can be a target, then you're someone who should be able to protect yourself. So I think for the most part, guys, uh, they'll go and, 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 and get a firearm. They'll learn how to use it. They'll get it registered and all of that. But it's mainly for protection not to set an example or, hey, this is how you do this. Right. I, that, and I think that's why this conversation is important. So you, though, are very big on gun safety and gun storage, mm -hmm. right? And so what is it? You've seen some gun violence in your life. What is the impetus for you to get involved in this issue? You've become involved in this issue. Why have you become involved? Well, number one, I want to destigmatize uh, gun ownership especially in our communities. A lot of African-Americans don't feel that they can go get a legal firearm. Uh, because? Because, b because of systematically in this country, the government hasn't always been on our side. And so once you start registering for guns and doing all they feel like, oh, I'm now I'm in a database. Now I'm, you know, now I'm linked to this and now they're going to be watching me. And now you have all these, these theories out there of why I don't want the government or, or someone knowing that I have a weapon. And then I'll become a target. And I think it's important for us to, to, to enjoy and to use those freedoms and liberty that others use in our country as African Americans. And I think it's important for us to know that, yes, you do have a right to protect yourself. You do have a right to go buy a firearm, register it, learn how to use it. But the most important thing is to store it safely. And how do you talk to your kids about, do the kids know that you have two boys? Yes. What do they know about this? They don't know we have a gun in the house. They won't listen to this podcast? No. Okay. My children don't play with guns. They don't play violent shooting games. Our job as parents is to try not to desensitize our kids to violence and, and, and gun violence. And that happens a lot through these games. You know, cowboys and robbers, you know, cowboys and, uh, you know, cops and robbers. Right. Like if you water, just a water gun, just the notion or the motion of of shooting someone. Lessens the impact of the reality of it. And they're not old enough. They're 11 and they're eight. They're in our minds. They're not old enough to be able to understand that. So as they get older, we'll teach them more about what gun violence is, right? They ask us all the time, why don't we get a chance to, to, to play with water guns or, or play with guns or, you know, play with sticks like guns? I said, because we are not into killing people. That is not what we're, we're doing. And that's a message that I think a lot of parents don't, maybe it doesn't resonate with them because you have a bunch of my son's friends from the age of five, six, seven, eight, nine, playing Fortnite, playing Halo, playing Call of Duty. And look, I'm a gamer. I play Halo all the time. I, I play all I don't I play all those games. I don't I don't play them in front of my children. And they asked me, well daddy, when can we play Halo? I said, when you're old enough to understand that this is just a game. So it, it you never want to desensitize them to violence. 
because then it just becomes normal. It becomes natural. It becomes just, oh, it's just another thing. You don't understand the, the, that death is permanent. In a game, you get shot, you get another life. Playing water guns in the back, you score somebody, no one dies, right? You see your parents have a gun, you go to school, you want to play Fortnite, you shoot someone, they don't come back. So you have a couple of areas that are important to you. One is storing your weapon safely, right? Yes. And then two is focusing on uh, that guns aren't available to people who shouldn't have them. Oh, I think it's another. Goodness. Yeah, that's yeah. another area of concern for you. And then three, and then three, is making sure that people know that they have a right to have a gun. But tell me about number two for a second, which is that people shouldn't have guns who are prohibited from having guns. This is another area I know you care about. Well, yeah, because it's that's the thing that I, I believe is running rampant in, in, in our, our nation when it comes to dealing with gun laws. People don't like strict gun laws because people want everybody to be able to buy a gun. As we know, everybody shouldn't have a gun. Everybody can't drive. Everybody can't vote. Everybody can't do certain things. So why should everybody have a gun? And, 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 and just on that premise alone, people should go, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I but think that you get the but you get the fight, you get the argument, right? You get no, 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 no. Wait. If you have a history of mental uh, illness, you shouldn't be able to go purchase a gun because you're clinically dealing with something and it alters your state of mind, your reality, whatever that infliction is, you're not, you know, you're not able to associate or disassociate certain things based on your ailment. You shouldn't be able to go buy a lethal weapon for your safety and for the safety of others. There's, um, we're just reading about something that says that very with mental illness, though, very few people are diagnosed with mental illness who are then going to go purchase a gun, right? Usually if somebody's going to cause an incident, there's been an event in their lives that has happened mm -hmm. rather than being diagnosed with mental Illness, but I think Ephraim, you know, one thing that's really interesting is most people favor probably you probably favor, I'll guess, universal background checks, red flag laws, mm -hmm. things like that, right? Most people do. What do you think that we're how do you think you started out talking about the divide in the country? How do you think we could do better at bridging that divide? Because it seems like on a lot of issues, and this is a big one, most people actually agree, but they don't know it. That's exactly right, because we live in a culture where you have to pick a side. That is that is our political narrative in this country. You must pick a side. Bipartisanship is a thing of the past. It very rarely exists uh, uh, now. And though that divide spills over into the issues. And one, one of them, the biggest one, and to me, um, is when you're talking about gun violence, right? You, the line is drawn, pro-life, pro-choice, right? Like it's just no, and, and no matter, even if it makes sense, you still got, oh, I'm on this side of the line though. And, and I think we live in that, that, that society now, especially in this country where if you say, hey, look, everybody doesn't, everybody shouldn't have a gun or shouldn't be able to purchase a gun immediately. Oh, well, that's un-American. That is right, but without even knowing the reason why. Right. right. If you have a history of violent behavior and if you have some misdemeanors or you have a felony of, of whatever, you shouldn't be able to go anywhere on the planet and buy any type of gun. Right. So how do we, though, get closer to solving this in terms of bringing people together? You know, I'm not even sure if it's apropos of this, but I was I was reading a quote from Senator Mark Kelly from Arizona, former astronaut, and he gave a quote from... You talk about bipartisanship where he said, 
Well, in the Senate, you know, there are colleagues on the other side of the aisle that I get along with well. And people wrote in to say, well, that's horrible. You're horrible. I'm never voting for you again. You don't get it. And all he said was, I get along with some people on the other side of the aisle, right? And that's enough for people to lose their minds. And that seems to me, I'm with you. In other words, that I feel like most people agree on a lot of the issues, but the loudest voices are often the ones that get heard and -hmm. they're the most disagreeable, right? So I think most people would agree where you are, which is- We live in, yeah. Which is that there should be more bipartisanship, more working together, but how do we make that happen a bit in terms of the gun issue? We, we have to start having conversations. We've stopped having conversations and just start talking at each other, right? If we disagree on something, Twitter, Twitter has created an environment of non-listening conversations. If I uh, disagree with you, I'm no longer listening to you. I'm just waiting for you to stop talking right? so I can respond, vice versa. So instead of me listening to you and trying to understand where you're coming from, all I hear is the no and I don't agree, right? And so now I'm not even listening To your point, you're not listening to mine because I don't agree with you. Right. So we need to start listening. We need to start having conversations. All right. You take the right, you take the left, whatever that is. And we need to sit down and really talk about it. Hey, guys, do you think someone who has this, this, and this should be able to go get a gun? Oh, absolutely not. Well, that's how we feel. But all we hear is, oh, you said he can't have a gun. No, no, that's not what I said. I said a person who has a record of this, this, and this. Right. Right. All you heard was that he shouldn't right. or she shouldn't be able to, to 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 buy a weapon. And I think once, and that goes across the board for a myriad of issues, but especially for this one, because this is the issue that's always divided the country. You have a radio show on Fox Sports, right? Yes. So the the difference is that when you have a radio show, I'm assuming you take callers. Yeah, we take callers sometimes. And people don't always agree with you. Of course not. Right. And if you were just doing it on Twitter, you could say whatever you want. No one can really respond. You don't have to listen to them. That's really the difference between hosting a radio and, and, show. And, yeah. And the, and the thing about Twitter that I like, whenever I do something in, in politics, right? Oh, that's when everybody I, I very rarely check my Twitter when I'm live on the air or when I'm doing CNN or something like that. Then I check it. And then you get all of these people with this, this hate, hate, hate. The thing I do is I don't respond back with hate. I respond back with a question. Why am I an asshole? Why do you think I'm ignorant? Why do you? And because I ask the question, their reply is different. They write something evil or terrible expecting me to lash back out at them. When I don't, it makes them now have to think about their reply because if I lash out, they already know what they're coming back with, right? That's right. the psychology behind listening. If you're in a, a heated debate or an argument with someone, don't respond like they think you're going to respond because now you make them have to listen and you make them have to think. So I'll say, okay, tell me why. Because you don't know what you're talking about and you don't know this. Well, explain it to them. Now, now they're not talking and they're not typing in all caps. I guarantee you, my wife is witness to this. At the end of these conversations, it's like, all right, I, 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 I get it. I, I, right. That's everybody wants a fight. I totally because agree. Everybody voice, wants to fight. Right. It's totally true. Everybody wants to fight. Absolutely. Everybody wants to fight. I, what I do is a little different than you, Ephraim. When people curse at me when I do something on television, they write and they tell me to drop dead. I write back and say, well, <laughs> thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And then they'll write back. They write back in all caps. Don't appreciate it. I hate you. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm not really engaging them, uh, but you're doing it the right way, uh, which is great. And then, so Ephraim, you have, how do you find the time to be active 
as an activist? Because you have the TV show, which is mm -hmm. Bel Air, which is yep. coming back. Yes. Second season. Second season in the middle of uh, writing my episode now. Fantastic. Um, and then how do you have time to even be an activist and work on these issues? Well, it's important to have kids. I have kids. My main driving force and motivation for activism is my children. My mother and father sacrificed so much to make this world better, this country better for me. That opened up opportunities for me. I seized those opportunities and created a life and a lifestyle that they could have only dreamt of. My job as a parent now is to do the same for them. And that comes with politics, activism, having a voice. That's why it's important. That's why you make the time for things that are important. And nothing is more important to me on this planet Earth than to making this world a safer, better place for my two boys. Ephraim, um, thank you. Uh, you know, I know that you do a lot of stuff. I've seen you do it. Um, and I appreciate all the work that you do. Uh, and the time that you manage to find, you've got a very busy full life. So I think it's kind of incredible. You're a bit of a role model, if you don't mind my saying. Um, and I want you to, uh, at this point, you know, at the end of each show, we ask the guest to tag somebody that they think would be good for us to talk to on the podcast. Who do you think would be a good guest for us to talk to? Who would you tag? I would tag my best friend. I call him my brother. We grew up together. We lived together. His name is Dion Taylor. He's a prolific director. Um, and he is also an activist. He is tremendous in, uh, in the community, trying to make this world a better place for not only his kids, but for my kids and your kids. Uh, I would like to tag Dion Taylor. Thanks, Ephraim. It's great of you to join us today. We'll be watching, listening on Saturday nights to your radio show. Uh, Saturday from 4 to 7 Pacific, uh, 7 to 10 uh, Eastern. We'll be listening. We'll be watching Bel Air season two. I'm sure that by the time that comes out, you'll have 10 other things that we need to know about. <laughs> uh, but thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us today on Tag Ephraim. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. And now for Dr. Michael Siegel and Siegel Scope. Thanks, Matt. On today's episode of Siegel Scope, I want to talk in a little more detail about assault weapon bans. Um, and I want to give a personal perspective on my thinking on these laws and actually how it came to change. When I started in fire and violence prevention about 10 years ago, I was actually in favor of assault weapon bans. When I heard the term assault weapon, I thought, well, yeah, of course, it, it makes sense. Why should people be walking around with assault weapons? And my opinion changed, however, when I started looking at the definition the way that assault weapons were defined in the law. And I found that the way these weapons are defined are actually based largely on cosmetic features of the gun rather than on aspects of the gun that make it more lethal. So the first thing I went, I did was I went into a store, into a gun store, and I said, you know, do you mind spending a little time with me and show me, showing me some assault rifles and some non-assault rifles based on the state definition. And basically uh, the store owner showed me rifles that essentially looked exactly the same, but had slightly different features. For one example, uh, he showed me a, a stock on one a rifle that was uh, foldable and basically showed me in another gun that looked exactly the same. They had just driven a screw through that stock so that it couldn't move. It was no longer foldable. One of those was an assault weapon and one was not according to the law. And he showed me again, example after example of guns that were identical except for uh, a cosmetic feature, one being an assault rifle and the other not being an assault rifle. And so I went back and I, and I looked more carefully at the law and I realized that what you're really doing is you're saying it's these cosmetic features that we don't like. We don't want these cosmetic features on the gun because it looks scary. It makes it look scary and it makes it look like it's a military style weapon. 
But the reality is that that doesn't make it any more deadly. Now, obviously, if it were to have an automatic setting on it, so that were an actual military weapon, that would be a different story. But since they don't have an automatic setting on them, the only thing that really separates them from other very deadly semi-automatic weapons is that they have these, these cosmetic features. So let's go through in the 2022 proposed uh, federal assault weapons ban. Let's go through the six features that define an assault rifle and that separate it from a legal rifle that may be otherwise exactly the same. The first one is a pistol grip. Now, a, a pistol grip does not inherently make the gun more lethal. It's basically a, a doodad that's hanging down from the, from the barrel. Uh, what about a forward grip? That's the second one. Again, uh, it's a cosmetic feature of the gun, doesn't directly affect the lethality. The third is a folding stock or a telescoping stock. That has nothing to do with the lethality of the gun. Um, a grenade launcher, again, completely cosmetic feature, doesn't make the gun any more lethal or, or less. Uh, a barrel shroud, barrel shroud is basically a protective device to protect the gun owner from burning themselves, um, touching the hot metal after the gun fires. Um, it doesn't make the gun more lethal. And the final one is a threaded barrel. Um, again, a threaded barrel doesn't affect the lethality of the weapon. Uh, what it does is it allows for a flash suppressor or uh, a silencer to be attached. So again, these are all, essentially these are accessories. These are gun accessories that people sometimes like to put on their guns. That's what's being regulated here, not the lethality of the weapon, not the ability of the weapon to kill people or kill people more effectively or more quickly. The, the empirical research demonstrates that assault weapon bans are not effective in reducing uh, firearm violence rates. In fact, I co-authored one of the first studies that looked directly at the effect of assault weapon bans, specifically on public mass shootings. And we found that assault weapon bans have no effect on either the incidence or severity of mass shootings. So even if you're, ta if you're talking about firearm homicide as a whole, assault weapons really don't contribute much to that in, in, at all. And even if you're talking about specifically um, mass shootings, while assault weapons do contribute to those, the empirical evidence uh, shows that they simply do not have an effect. I see no purpose to these laws. They do, however, have a negative effect, which is that they are going to bother uh, gun owners. And they're basically telling gun owners, yeah, we are here to take your guns away. Why would we want to do that if it's not going to have any actual effect? I mean, if these laws were found to, to save lives, and sure, go, you know, go for it. But since these laws are not saving lives, and there's no conceptual reason why they would save lives, uh, why alienate gun owners for no reason? Back to you, Matt. I'm Matthew Lippman, your host of TAG. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, we'd love for you to subscribe, give us a five-star rating, and tell your friends about us. You can find more episodes of TAG on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. Give us a follow on Instagram and Twitter at 97%org and tag who you'd like us to chat with next. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.